So we have three very capable chaplains, professionals, spiritual caregivers to help us navigate our way through this very important question. I will read the biography of each of our presenters before they speak. And we will begin with Chaplain Khoram Ahmed, who will be speaking about EOL, end of life care, for underrepresented Muslims, how COVID-19 created a tool for beyond the pandemic. Chaplain Khoram Ahmed serves as a community and crisis chaplain in central Ohio. His training and professional engagement in healthcare chaplaincy has taken him across major health systems in Los Angeles, California, Columbus, Ohio, and Stony Brook, New York. Khurram holds a Master of Divinity in Islamic Chaplaincy from Bayan Islamic Graduate School, and he has an ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical, pardon me, ecclesiastical, I'll say it one more time, endorsement through the Islamic Society of North America. I now call upon our dear, beloved Chaplain Khurram Ahmed to present to us now. Thank you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا وشفيعنا وحبيبنا ورسولنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم My name is Khurram Ahmed um, and this is presentation is called How COVID inspired a tool for beyond the pandemic my my cherished teachers my wonderful colleagues and my honored guests Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, when the pandemic came to these shores um, and New York was identified and labeled the epicenter of the pandemic, I was a staff chaplain at Stony Brook University Hospital in Long Island, New York. By April, the hospital was scaling back its activities and running at uh, only its essential functions, but it become very much a COVID hospital. During that time, we saw daily sustained expirations rise from under four per day at pre-pandemic levels to almost 30 a day by mid-May. So you can imagine uh, what a significant rise that is, less than four deaths per day pre-pandemic, and then peaking at almost 30 per day. And these dying were in very uh, stressful circumstances. Right? They were in strict isolation, away from their families and any other representatives and advocates. The pathology of the disease would often compromise the patient's capacity to communicate in speech and writing because of uh, fatigue and uh, difficulty breathing. This resulted in nursing staff who regularly offered the most intense bedside care at end of life to bear an even greater burden without direct presence of family, social work, and spiritual care. And nursing asked spiritual care for help. And when we sat down to discuss what the issues were and what spiritual care to, could do to support our nurses, uh, two concepts came up, moral injury and spiritual distress. A moral injury, um, Ned Dobos, a ethics researcher from Australia, actually teases moral injury into two separate and disparate uh, concepts. One he calls moral trauma and the other moral degradation. Moral trauma involves moral emotions such as guilt and shame becoming debilitating. The individual feels so guilty about what they have done or failed to do, or so ashamed of themselves, or so morally tainted that they struggle to function or to live a flourishing life away from their clinical duties. For what we mean by a crippled or crippling a flourishing life, some examples are self-harming behavior, which can range from poor self-care to suicidal practice, self-handicapping behavior, such as running away from your successes, and demoralization, which can manifest as confusion or even self-loathing. The primary symptom of moral trauma is acute and unrelenting feeling of guilt and shame 
the point of pathology. You feel guilty about what you have done or failed to do while you feel ashamed of yourself. If you think I did something horrible, a natural follow-up to that becomes what kind of person does this? What kind of person am I? Moral trauma is Lady Macbeth saying, here is the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Being unable to navigate a moral dilemma through a spiritual lens or value system creates trauma. And an individual that suffers moral trauma feels like a bad person. But repeated instances of moral trauma or even a single powerful incident can lead to moral degradation where people lose their capacity for virtue. It involves a corruption or corrosion of moral emotions. The individual does not feel morally troubled by what they have done or failed to do, but they should feel troubled. Moral emotions are distorted or muted. A person that suffers moral degradation becomes a worse person than prior to their trauma. In a 2019 interview, Hollywood actor Liam Neeson reflects on an occasion from his personal life when a friend of his was raped. And he shares his reaction saying, quote, my immediate reaction was, I asked, did she know who it was? No, what color were they? She said it was a black person. I went up and down areas carrying a bludgeon, hoping I'd be approached by somebody. I'm ashamed to say that, and I did it for maybe a week, hoping some black bastard would come out of a pub and have a go at me about something, you know, so that I could kill him. It took me a week, maybe a week and a half to go through that. It was horrible, horrible when I think back that I did that, God forbid. And so we see this capacity for virtue, like trust and warmth towards another is diminished because of a single instance. And the other uh, part of the equation that the nurses brought to us was spiritual distress. Chaplains are very familiar with this idea. It is a state in which the individual is at risk of experiencing a disturbance in his or her system of belief or value that provides strength, hope, and meaning to life. Spiritual distress may have a potentially harmful effect on an individual's quality of life. To speak about how far reaching spiritual distress can be and they say you know it's interrelated in terms of meaning transcendence values and psychosocial identity in plain english what that is to say is that it can affect overall life balance it can undermine someone's anchor point that is exterior to them it undermines what goodness and trueness are for that person and it can undermine relationships that together make up a person's singular identity based on their environment and the goals they play. So, moral trauma, moral degradation, and spiritual distress. Moral injury and spiritual distress for the nurses is manifested in some of the following ways. Feelings of inadequacy as the dead seemed to pile up and care providers couldn't navigate and perform their daily routine or the regular routine, I'm sorry. A regular routine for a nurse might be to speak with the family member about their dying or recently deceased loved one, right? And speaking with them at the bedside and offering them support. And that's often a mutually therapeutic exercise as it gives both parties, the care provider and the family, some space to absorb and process and move towards closure. Right. Another is that active self-care became virtually impossible. Before the pandemic, nursing staff could plan their self-care by requesting a tea for the soul from their chaplains or knowing if they had a difficult day you know, coming up, they could uh, prepare for it a little bit by um, ordering lunch, takeout and for their break room. And then that break room becomes a sort of oasis um, 
a place to check in and unwind, uh, something to look forward to, to break the, the stress of the clinical duties of the day. And of course, in the pandemic, none of these things could happen. Very specific to Stony Brook is that the nursing staff was largely Roman Catholic and would care for these patients that are suffering and dying all alone. And in the helplessness, nurses would unwittingly do harmful things. For instance, a nurse might perform a cross over a dying patient, not knowing what their faith was, or put a rosary in their hand, or recite scripture over them, or place a Bible in the room. And when the nurses were asked why they did these things, the response was one of two. Well, I had to do something. Or, what's the harm in it? We can look at these situations and see the harm. I ask you to have compassion for the people in these situations. They're using these religious practices, not for the patient's sake, not that the patient would be granted salvation, but that their own needs and coping strategies in the midst of this crisis kind of manifested in this way. It's clearly unhealthy and harmful, not just for patients, but for the care providers to engage like this. But what we, can we offer besides righteous indignation? We created an end of life reference guide so nursing staff could provide culturally competent care. I was asked to write the one for Muslims and I'd like to briefly go over that document with you here. So this is the introduction, the Islamic or Muslim tradition. Throughout the dying process, it is important that a Muslim's modesty, which is often a deeply spiritual practice in life, be maintained even in death. To the best of your ability, please try to keep the patient's body covered with available linens. This is the introduction to the document. Notice the tone. It aims to be warm and gentle. It's inviting. I try to communicate as I would in an email to a colleague who is uninformed but sincere. As the patient's death approaches, one, the patient's linen should be clean if possible. Two, using available means, navigate to YouTube and search for a Quran recitation and launch one of the thousands of available playlists. The recited Quran is always in Arabic, make it something every Muslim, regardless of background, will be familiar with and hopefully find meaningful. There might be some cultural differences over which passages from the Quran are most appropriate at the end of life, but the team should rest assured knowing there is no wrong or inappropriate passage from the Quran. Chapters 13 and 36 are very common in such times. Again, it's a reassuring and informal style that acknowledges that whoever is reading this may be in crisis. It aims to offer only as much information as needed and tries to not be confusing by making the care provider doubt their actions. If a person is actively, if a Muslim, I should say, is actively dying at home, observant Muslims make, make, an, make the effort to orient, orient the bed or the individual toward the Qibla. Such instructions in an ICU may be medically difficult well, logistically impossible. And so those things are left out. I felt it was important to include what may seem reasonable based on my own experience and knowledge of what end of life looks like in the ICU setting. I didn't want to make a demanding list that would have the care provider thinking, how the heck am I supposed to do this? It's crazy. Continuing the document, uh, number three, Family may wish to be present in the room by a speaker phone or video chat so they can say relevant prayers. There's a strong belief that a person, if at all possible, die in a state of belief in God by physically affirming their faith through speech. Loved ones will often coach those at the very end of their lives to express and affirm the foundational beliefs of Islam. So not a place for theological education, but still offering a brief insight and context for what the providers might be seeing. The desire to 
the desire for a loved one to see their dying, say, La ilaha illallah, sometimes aggressively pleading with them at the bedside, screaming at them almost, can be disquieting to non-Muslim staff. So this is meant to offer reassurance to the staff that what they might see, what might appear to be anxiety inducing is actually culturally appropriate and relevant. The aim of the document is still to keep the threshold as low as possible while giving simple instructions about what you can practically perform and do. Creating a much longer list of responsibilities prefaced with if possible, if possible, would make the document feel lengthy and overwhelming. As it is, it fits on a single page and it feels manageable. It feels digestible. In the moments after the patient's death. One, the deceased's eyes should be gently closed. Two, the deceased's limbs should be straightened if possible and the feet brought together. Three, the deceased head may be wrapped around the chin and over the top to keep the mouth shut using available means like a bandage wrap or a strip of gauze. And four, the deceased should be completely covered with a clean linen. Again, easy, easy to follow, simple steps. The tone may seem a little more direct and demanding here as we move to post-mortem. The message to the nurses, you can do these things which are ritually meaningful and dignifying to the patient and move on. You don't need to stay next to the body as you might for an Orthodox Jew. You don't need to say the Lord's Prayer as you might for a Christian. Right? And, you know, just this simple inclusion of a detail like a bandage wrap or strip of gauze that is not something that is that you might need from a, from the chapel. It's, it's not as a special type of uh, head wrap that you have, like a hijab or whatever somebody's, wherever somebody's imagination might take them. Um, you know, to, to, to really make the language as simple and accessible as possible was one of the goals, as I said. And finally, further care. Muslims aim to bury their deceased as soon as possible within 24 hours, unless a medical or legal concern demands otherwise. Family will aim to have their funeral home move quickly to secure the release of the deceased. Any support in facilitating and expediting the process would be invaluable. End of document. That's it. The response, actually very positive. Excellent feedback from the Division of Nursing reporting that it was clear and easy to understand of immediate value as a simple reference guide. And this particular, the, the Muslim version or the, or the document crafted to care for uh, Muslim patients and families in this way was so appreciated in style and tone that um, the, the, the chaplains and, and the, the authors of the documents for the other faiths were asked to copy as, uh, the style and tone of this one as much as they could. Um, copies were requested not just for the COVID isolation units, but every nurse's station across the hospital. In the days and weeks that followed after uh, this document became, um, became, was put into heavy use, bereavement calls to family that the spiritual care department um, performed detailed the end of life care. And it marked a huge relief for the loved ones who would have had to taken on the moral injury, the moral trauma, the moral degradation, the spiritual distress, in addition to the grief of feeling like they weren't there and they they didn't make sure, they didn't perform the fard kifaya, the communal obligation of caring for their dying loved one in a way that was Islamically relevant and Islamically meaningful. So the document was originally created to ease the distress of uh, our staff, but very soon we discovered there was a massive uh, benefit to loved ones. You know, um, so this document has since, you know, is, is moving towards being a formal part of uh, the nurse's responsibility every time a patient be goes into what is considered actively dying. You know, the nurses should look around and, and check the document, make sure that uh, 
they are you know ready and and and, and able to do what needs to be done from these simple instructions it's been adopted as a resource by the association of muslim chaplains as well as 40 um, islamic organizations that are part of the national muslim task force for covid 19 and it even was uh, translated to Spanish by a Chile-based think tank uh, for free distribution across uh, Latin America. And so with that, in conclusion, I want to bring two brief case studies. One, a patient in a persistent vegetative state is transferred to our ICU from a long-term acute care facility. The facility lost many of its records due to a software issue and misplaced this patient's personal belongings. The patient is actively dying. The facility social worker note lists that the patient is Muslim. Here's a second case. Jane Doe is homeless and admitted to the ICU from the emergency department. She presented as nonverbal and without any identifying paperwork. She is placed in a medically induced coma the friend who brought the patient to the ED has no other information regarding the patient, except that her name is Aisha. So these two cases are actually from my personal experience that happened years before the pandemic. In both these cases, the role of the nursing staff, the role the nursing staff has to play is essentially the same as those nurses at the height of COVID. These are unrepresented patients without advocates at the bedside, dying in the ICU setting. And the nursing staff is left to navigate and process their harmful helplessness. End of life care providers without any functional literacy of a religious tradition can perform a handful of actions and provide a few services that are remarkably empowering to them and affirming for their families. And so as finally, as a final note, um, there's been an effort now, my next step is to see this document um, delivered to remote hospitals that might not have a Muslim chaplain or a chaplaincy surrogate, a Muslim staff person who's kind of steps in in a pinch. Um, so their nurses and their end of life care staff have the resources, have this simple guide to not have to take on that feeling of helplessness of I'm not doing anything and what I'm doing is probably very, very wrong. And so to be able to dispel that, to, to ease that burden and uh, and not, yeah, um, inshallah may it be of benefit. That is the end of my time. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Chaplain Khoram. Uh, for that uh, very informative presentation. Uh, matters of transitioning from this life to the next are never easy. And one of the challenges that we have during this time is the question of visible and physical presence. Uh, a major part of spiritual care, as I've learned over the years, is being present, physically present. Um, and we definitely are dealing with uh, uh, serious challenges uh, in that regard.